This video explains why we urgently need to transform the way we prevent and treat kidney disease. Health is an essential indicator of any country's prosperity. But in our ageing societies, healthcare systems need a paradigm shift to cope with increasing demand and spiralling costs. In Europe, for example, nearly 100 million people suffer from chronic kidney disease. Current predictions for what's next are alarming. Today, CKD is one of the most expensive diseases for healthcare systems to treat, and dialysis has a substantial ecological impact. To remain sustainable, kidney patient care must shift from reactive hospital treatments to proactive prevention and treatments at home. This is the story of next generation artificial organs, which are already well advanced. They need a relatively small investment to transform the lives of millions of kidney patients worldwide. To understand the importance of this journey, we travel to the Dutch province of Overijssel. Welcome to the city of Kampen, the birthplace of artificial organs. This year we celebrate the pioneers who made the first breakthroughs in kidney replacement therapy. It began 80 years ago in the Netherlands, right here in the city of Kampen. During the Second World War, a young Dutch doctor refused to work with the Nazis. He also refused to believe the medical view of those times that nothing could be done for patients with kidney failure. As a result of his courage and dedication, Dr. Kolf's inventions keep millions of people alive today. His way of working still inspires the Dutch Kidney Foundations to keep pushing for new exciting developments. I invite you on a tour to explore the past, the present and possible the future of kidney replacement therapy. Meet your tour guide, scientist Dr. Fokko Wieringa. Before we embark on our journey, let's first learn about kidney failure through the story of a dialysis patient named Philip. Philip undergoes dialysis three times a week. Why? Because his kidneys are highly damaged. Healthy kidneys remove waste products and excess water from our blood and secrete these in the urine. They also control blood pressure, blood sugar, and the acidity of our body. But what if our kidneys fail, as for Philip, a patient with chronic kidney disease? In this case, the removal of waste products is massively decreased and waste accumulates in the blood. This damages our organs and makes us sick. When kidney function falls below 15%, to stay alive, either transplantation or dialysis is needed. Transplantation is by far the best option, but there is a shortage of donor organs. Also, not every patient is suitable for transplantation. Hence, dialysis is the mainstay therapy. Let me take you to the place where dialysis was invented by the amazing Dr. Kolf, who became known as the father of artificial organs. So here we are in Kampen, a nice city nestled alongside the river IJssel in the Netherlands. This is the hospital where it all happened. Let's walk up to our host Herman Broers, who wrote a biography about Dr. Willem Kolf. Herman. But can you take us back to 1943? Yes, yeah, sure I can. And Dr. Kolf will help us. Let's go to the room where it all started. All right. Nice. Look at those uh, two windows. That's where we're going. Aha. Uh -huh. That's the Kolf room. That's the Kolf room. Yep. Great that they preserved this nice building. And it's now an elderly home. What fascinated me about Kolf was his pioneership. Being uh, uh, a pioneer in the middle of nowhere during World War II, saving millions of lives, uh, with nobody around, inventing new machines like that. An ex extraordinary character. Here it is, after you. Okay, so this is it. Oh. Well, so yes. this is the 1942-1943 uh, cold rotating drum, artificial kidney. And uh, this is the replica that was built. Yeah, I see that um, that one had the famous aluminium taken from a crashed plane. 
Yeah, this was from the uh, shot down uh, plane, uh, and uh, in the in the replica it's wood. It was a second and third version. They were also a wooden, wooden drum. Wooden yeah, drums, because yes. aluminum you couldn't get. No, no. To any more after the first one, but uh, you see that uh, the patient is connected uh, with uh, uh, this rubber tubing. Well, then the blood goes into the machine. You have the connecting water pump uh, of the T Ford, and then it goes into the cellophane. And this is where actually from here to there, rotating in this bath of uh, dialysate, where the dialysis takes place. You know, it is uh, yeah, uh, it's the bring, bringing uh, toxic waste products from the blood from one fluid to another through a membrane um, so. in a moving condition. So what we nowadays have as a dialyzer, say about this height and this diameter, with all the fibers inside having the same surface as this, Yep. Or even even more nowadays. It's 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 better. It's working better on a smaller smaller surface, but it's doing exactly the yeah, same. Exactly. As yeah. Back in 1943. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's sit down and talk about it. Company is a small city. Um, they were very nice to me. They wanted to have an internist, and I was the first for a very small hospital. Um, I made the royal sum of 10,000 guilders per year in the first year, divided by two and a half, and you have the number of dollars that I made. I said, now I can afford to make an artificial kidney. Kampen was an isolated city, uh, the seashore and the river Isel. Uh, there were 19,000 people living here and they had only one doctor in the hospital, and Kolf became the second one. And uh, so it was uh, a small town, but um, it was perfect for his artificial kidney project because nobody was watching. Now this here is cellophane tubing. It uh, looks like a ribbon, it's not, it's hollow. And it's artificial sausage skin. And it's an excellent dialyzer. And this dialysis means that if you have blood inside here, Small molecules will go through the pores of the membrane to the outside where you have a dialyzing fluid. And so urea and other products that the kidneys normally excrete will go out. And another thing happens. Sodium chloride and other electrolytes would also go out. So you, put them, you add them to the dialyzing fluid on the outside and now they go out and in you get an equilibration through this membrane. So if the sodium of the patient is too low, it goes higher. And if it's too high, it goes lower. It normalizes it. And this, is, this white powder is urea. And all this urea was removed in one dialysis, which is incredible, isn't it? It goes very fast. And in the beginning, there were always people that said, well, urea is not toxic. I would say, eat it. So here in this very room, the first hemodialysis treatment that awoke a patient from a uremic coma happened. Who was this patient? The first patient uh, treated by Kolf was Janni Schrijver. She was a housemaid from Zwolle. Um, she collapsed at work one day and she turned blind. And that's why she visited an eye doctor in Zwolle. And uh, he knew what was wrong with her, that she had kidney problems, and said, well, I can send you to Dr. Kolf. Uh, he might have uh, some new ideas on how to treat you. So Janni arrives per ambulance, the tricycle, and her father is with her. And, you know, Kolf takes him apart. And he's the first doctor that explains him in plain language what's actually happening to his daughter. And this man listens intensely and, and he asks, of course, can you save my daughter? And Kolf is very plain about that. He says, she's very, very ill. There's very little chance, but I'll do my very best to do for her what I can. So Father Schreiber decides that the vicar should come first uh, to bless her and pray with her. And when Jenny falls into urema coma, he says, it's time. And so they wheel her off to this very room, and Jan is connected. And it's March 17, 1943. So first they do batch-wise blood withdrawal, treat it with the machine, and put it back. 
And Johnny stays alive for 14 days, but it doesn't help enough. And she gets overly punctured, because for every connection, they need to cut another vessel to take the blood and put it back. And Kolf starts realizing, you know, he's running out of time. So he decides to put Janni in line with the machine, which hasn't been done anywhere before. This is a historical moment. So they connect her in line and wait. They take turns at the bed with the kidney team. And after a long wait, the miracle happens. Janni regains consciousness. On April 4th, 1943, Janni Schrijver was the first patient ever recovering from a uremic coma by hemodialysis. She's clear-minded, she can talk, she is really conscious. It's a miracle. This gives Kolf hope. You know, this is a clear miracle. Janni might pull through. But unfortunately, two days later, she has a relapse, falls into coma again. They again connect the machine. And in total, they do this four times. And then, unfortunately, the arterial connection is not doing it anymore. Everything starts leaking, the bath starts foaming. They have to disconnect Yanni and they know she's doomed now. And so she's wheeled off from this room and will die. So it turned out that the machine itself actually was doing quite good a job. But the vascular access, that was the Achilles heel. And this problem was only solved in 1960 in Seattle by Wayne Quinton and Belding Scribner. Well, I, uh, I just thought of the shunt. I mean, uh, you know, you'd used uh, uh, vessels each time to do a dialysis. And indeed on him, we used, I think we dialyzed him three times and used three separate arteries and veins. And uh, I just suddenly said, well, heck, if we can use the shunt and permanently cannulate an artery and a vein, maybe we can keep people going for a long time. And hadn't people thought of that before? That seems yeah, fairly obvious. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Niels Alvall in Lund, Sweden had thought of the idea in, in 49, uh, but uh, we had the good fortune at the time that DuPont had just uh, come on the market with Teflon tubing and uh, he had used glass and couldn't keep it open. So the, the real secret was that it was the Teflon tubing. At that time, it just again just happened that Clyde Shields, a machinist from Boeing, was dying of uremia in our clinic, and we put it in on March 9th, 1960, and, and that was the rest is history. The combination of Scribner shunt with Kolf's machine opened the way to chronic dialysis. And by 1972, 90% of Scribner's patients dialyzed at home. One example was the suitcase kidney of Dr. Eli Friedman. Watch this amazing NBC interview from 1976, where Miss Josephine Berman tells about her vacation with a suitcase kidney. Uh, this past September, I went on vacation with my husband. We went west and we took the suitcase kidney with us and we dialyzed in Utah, in Las Vegas, and in San Francisco in hotel room. And it went very well. We never had a problem. You did it all on your own? We did it all on our own. But then something happened. Reimbursement for home dialysis was sharply reduced. From then on, home dialysis rapidly declined. In-center dialysis became the dominant business model because an in-center machine earns reimbursements for up to six patients and a machine at home only for one. During the last 50 years, dialysis, when compared to, for instance, consumer electronics industry, has suffered from an innovation paradox, nicely summarized by these patient comments. I look at the mortality rates after la in the last 50 years, and I don't see any big improvements there, as far as I know. They're basically still the same technology as they were 50 years ago, which is, is 
horrible. I mean, it's it's it I, it blows my mind that that can happen. And usually, what I say is, if the if the innovation in consumer electronics had been like the innovations in dialysis machines, my laptop or my phone, for that matter, would be the size of four New York City blocks. But that lack of innovation is about to change. I'm Fokko Wieringa from the Netherlands, and I'm an advisory board member of Home Dialyzers United. And for Home Dialyzers United, we see some exciting news here. This is the next kidney. This is a collapsible home hemodialysis machine that you just collect down, and it fits into a carry-on trolley that you can take along on the airport. Now, this machine has been developed by the Dutch Kidney Foundation. They put in a lot of money together with the Neo Kidney Trust. And Next Kidney is a Swiss and a Dutch and a Singaporean cooperation. It's really interesting to see this machine. Let's walk over to the machine when it's completely built up. The beauty of this machine is that it's going to come in under 20 pounds, 25 pounds, which is even doable for someone like myself. It fits in a suitcase that you've got um, overhead luggage, on wheels, super easy, uh, two, three main parts, they all snap together, uh, disposable cartridges. This is great. Are you looking at trials? So your... she marked uh, will be 2024. Okay. Then it's complete as, as we plan it now. The trials are being planned. Yeah. One of the nephrologists that is doing the the trials, uh, Karen Gerritsen from Utrecht, is on, their way, on her way to the booth here. Uh, and um, yes, we're, we're actually doing that. In Singapore, they already did yes. the sorbent trials. And so, um, yes, it's coming. For me to see it come this far is really exciting. Five years is not a long time, you know. That for a medical device, yeah, uh, making it in five years is not long. But for a patient, five years is eternity. That's true. That is. True. And so we want to speed it up That's as good as we can. Person, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I am. Everything that we design should be you now centered around the patients, and that and that's what we do. But we're not going to stop here. Even if we make them very small. Present hemodialysis machines still do a relatively poor job compared to healthy kidneys. Hemodialysis patients have a limited life expectancy. Within five and a half years, 70% die. Their chance of heart problems is much higher compared to people of the same age not being on dialysis. And for young people, this increased chance of death is even a thousandfold. The American Association of Kidney Patients declared the decade of the kidney and the European Kidney Patient Federation and European Kidney Health Alliance joined in. The decade of the kidney was designed by kidney patients and works for kidney patients. Together with our fellow patients in over 90 countries, we're working with our governments to make certain that they bring together the best minds and the highest talents so that we can see new kidney replacement therapies within the decade. Here in the United States, we enjoy the support of the United States Congress and the U.S. Congressional Kidney Caucus, which has highlighted our efforts. Our motto is this, if not now, when? Patients need more choices, and they need them soon. I appear before you today as co-chair of the Congressional Kidney Caucus, but also as a cardiothoracic surgeon and as a longtime patient advocate. As a doctor, I know and understand the challenges so many of you have faced while managing chronic kidney disease and kidney failure. I realize that kidney disease is not simply a medical issue. It is an employment, workforce, and economic security issue as well. In 2019, AAKP called the coming decade the decade of the kidney, and I agree. I salute AAKP's efforts to organize patients in over 90 countries across the globe to support the rapid development of artificial kidneys through an international consortium. Clearly, the U.S. Congressional Kidney Caucus wants to stimulate innovation, just like the Kidney Health Group of European Parliament members does. 100 million people in Europe suffer from chronic kidney disease, and by 2040, it will be the fifth leading cause of death in the world. The majority of the patients are not even aware of their condition. And on the other hand, treatments for kidney failure have not changed significantly in the last 50 years. Dialysis dates from 1942 and transplantation 
is not always possible. Yes, there have been some improvements, but treatments remain very burdensome for some patients. Moreover, the cost for our health systems is estimated at 140 billion euros annually in Europe. High costs for dialysis are a global issue, which needs to change as soon as possible. The American taxpayer pays billions of dollars every year to support status quo dialysis therapy and the accompanied high costs of disability unemployment caused by kidney disease. This is not a sustainable situation for either the patient community or the taxpayer. An implantable artificial kidney is possible if during the coming seven years, just 0.3% of what we now yearly spend on dialysis is invested in an international consortium, that would mean that we can save at least 30% of dialysis costs from 2030 onwards. That's a hundredfold return of investment every year. We are working hard to increase organ donation in America, but I believe further development of artificial organs will also help save lives. These technologies must be encouraged because they will also create new industries and new jobs. They will also lead to better opportunities for kidney patients to remain fully engaged in society. Make no mistake about it, advances in care innovations for kidney patients, both here in the United States and across the globe, would not be possible without the sustained involvement and ingenuity of companies operating in the free market. Government alone cannot create and maintain the momentum needed to achieve long-term changes in kidney treatment and patient outcomes without the private sector. We need an international consortium of patients, doctors and nurses, policymakers, inventors and investors, engineers and entrepreneurs who all jointly work together in the decade of the kidney. I would like to call on you, commissioners. Stella Kiriakidis and Maria Gabriel to tackle chronic kidney disease together with us and to create and implement an EU systematic approach. Kidney failure is a fast-growing global problem that affects all nations. Today's dialysis is unsustainable. Patients deserve a better solution and innovators across the globe already solved pieces of this puzzle. We all share the same biology. And so let's jointly invest to realize an implantable artificial kidney. If you want to know more about chronic kidney disease, then scan the QR code and read everything about it in a Nature Outlook special issue that I can highly recommend.